Good evening and welcome back to our fall Bible study, Believe in Me, Jesus in the Gospel of John. Today we are in lesson three and we'll be in the end of chapter two and the beginning of chapter three for Jesus in the temple and with the rabbi. Last lesson, we covered Jesus' first disciples and first miracle or sign of turning water to wine at the wedding in Cana. So um, does anyone remember what the significance of Jesus opening his ministry at a wedding and turning water to wine? Or of course, you're welcome to say anything that you've thought about about that lesson or anything that stood out to you. Well, when he says his response after Mary asked him, he says, what do I have to do with you? My hour has not yet come. Yeah. So Jesus, um, he does resist on the basis of his hour has not yet, yet come. And we talked about the meaning of that and how we're... Uh, Every time we hear that phrase, the hour, Jesus's hour, we're sort of pointing towards the, the hour of the crucifixion or Jesus's glorification at the crucifixion. And so Jesus says it's not yet time for that. And yet he goes ahead and does the miracle. And he does it in, um, I think, because of that, my hour has not yet come in a somewhat hidden way. Only some people know what he has done. Yeah, what else? It just dawned on me tonight that that's kind of his first um, miracle in, in this. And it has to do with wine, which is also communion and, you know, his sacrifice on the cross. That's yeah, a very par powerful connection. A very powerful connection. Yeah, great point. And everything sort of threads together. And we see that John does not have a formal institution of the Lord's Supper story at any point in his gospel. And yet we see these elements sort of woven through. And I think this is um, right at the beginning here. We have this sense of wine and how it is associated with the wedding. Well, the wedding was the best celebration that a first century Jew would ever attend. And it was how Israel pictured the coming of the Messiah as a wedding banquet that was flowing with abundant wine. And so the wedding institution is, it is um, it's built in to think about, oh, this would be the the celebration of Messiah. This would be the coming of salvation. And what did Jesus do when Jesus took on the providing of wine for this wedding? He became the host. He became the host. So that Jesus has replaced the groom, the host of the banquet. He himself is now the groom, the host of the banquet, um, providing the wine, um, opening this idea of the messianic banquet of salvation. And it's just implied right here at the very beginning of the gospel of John, right? It's, it's in a small way, it's in a hidden way. And yet we see that this institute that John opens with four Jewish institutions and wedding is the first one. We see that Jesus replaces the host. Other, other comments, uh, thoughts about last week? You also talked about how massive the water jugs were. Yeah, yeah, abundant wine, right? Jesus made up to 180 gallons of wine. This would be a whole lot of wine that, you know, in a sense, it's a way of saying that it will flow so generously. And that this was his first sign, John comments um, and John is going to bring us seven signs of Jesus because John loves to use the symbolic number of seven um, items uh, in a list here and there'll be seven signs of Jesus here in this in the first half of John and um, we begin to have a separation between those who believe in Jesus or those who trust in Jesus and those who don't yeah. Well, let's go on to Jesus cleansing the temple. Would someone please read John 
2, 13 through 17. I can. Thank you. And the, and the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went to Jerusalem, and he found the temple, those who were selling oxen, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated. And he made a scourge of the cords and drove them all over the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out coins of the money changers and turned over the temples. And those were, those were selling to the doves, he said, Take these things away. Stop making my father's house a house of merchandise. His disciples remembered that this was written, zeal for the house will consume me. Okay, thank you. All right, the scene is set. Jesus is in Jerusalem. He's at the temple, and he finds all this commerce in the temple, right? Is this a familiar story? Do we know this story from elsewhere? From the synoptic gospels yeah i see nodding and yes the synoptic gospels this is one of the few stories that's actually in all four gospels and we talked the last the uh, first lesson um two lessons ago how john has moved this story to the opening of the gospel and how you know so, some people think that it happened twice but he doesn't promise any chronology here and so it may be that this john just moved it and why would he do that for thematic reasons. So let's see what those reasons might be. What does Jesus do? He cleanses the temple. Yeah, how? What, is, what does it look like to cleanse the temple? It sounds- um, He's kicking out the riffraff and the people trying to make money in the house of God and setting it towards its proper purpose. Okay, so there is a sense of um, so he 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 makes this whip, a scourge of cords. He drives them out. He overturns the table, pours out the coins. It is kind of destructive of the business that is going on at the um, temple. And the synoptics all give us some uh, other reasons for Jesus doing this. Some um, ways that Jesus uh, says that the leadership of Jerusalem and of Israel have been um, falsely, have been leading badly and then falsely trusting in the temple as what will save them, even though they're leading badly. But we don't get any of that here. It's just, he just says, stop making my father's house about a place of business. And what stands out to that, to, out to us in verse 16, stop making my father's house a house of business. What do y'all notice? Well, he's directly admitting that he's son of the father for one. My father, right? It's it's qu quite a direct intimacy here, isn't it? Um, and it sounds like ownership. Right. When the heir is in the house, the heir has authority. The heir already somewhat owns what the father owns. And Jesus claims the authority in this to say what the temple should be like. What did the disciples remember later? That it was written in Psalm about zeal for your house will consume me. Zeal for your house will consume me. Okay, we want to unpack this one a little bit. All right. So first of all, notice, you know, we talked about how we think that this is written from a later perspective, right? This is not written from someone who's um, journaling at the time, right? This is a, a reflected view and we get that long view here later they remembered um, also in israel zeal is an important keyword zeal is the characteristics of protecting even by violence israel from corruption from the inside zeal was how the levites were given the role of the priesthood and there's a story in Numbers 25, 11 about how the Levites come into a kind of orgy situation where 
um, the Israelites are uh, partying with the Moabites and worshiping their gods, and they use violence to stop this behavior. And it's their zeal that makes them worthy of the priesthood. Well, this concept runs all through scripture, and we even see it in Paul, because when Paul gives his resume and says, I was all these things, in Philippians 3, 6, he says, as for zeal, persecuting the church. And so Paul is saying, I had it. I had the characteristic of zeal where I thought I needed to protect Israel from the inside. I had to stamp out the church because it was corrupting the church, uh, because it was corrupting Israel from within. And so zeal is a characteristic that Israelites expect from a prophet, a priest, or a king. And I love how Judy mentioned that this is a passage from Psalms because this is a Psalm of David that describes David's struggle when David is oppressed by his enemies. And David's claiming to be the one who is faithful to God when all those who oppose him are not. And so even in this quote, we see Jesus is in the role of successful to successor of David and the one who's faithful when the leaders of Israel are not faithful. So this is critical. Judy, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say when I was looking at this earlier, it when I was comparing the synoptics to John, it it made me I mean, the way John in John, typical John fashion, <laughs> not in not in the order that everybody else puts it, but in the way he chooses his words and like he paints a picture of zeal far better than the other books do um the like he makes you accords. feel it yes <laughs> like he, he actually his illustrations are are awesome like it makes you get a front row seat to what they're experiencing at ground zero <laughs> wow. it's possible that i love whatever gospel I've studied most recently best, but, <laughs> you know, when we're in John, we really see, oh my goodness, there's not a word wasted. It's mm -hmm. every word is meaningful. Yeah. Yeah. So Jesus by, you know, in the, this puts him in the role of the one who is the true leader of Israel. Let's read on and kind of see what happens with this he you know he's claiming the authority to say what the temple should be like let's see how that's received would someone read 18 through 22 i'll read it thank you so the jew said to him what sign do you show us for doing these things jesus answered them destroy this temple and in three days i will raise it up the jews then said it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days but he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's go back. Let's look at verse 18, because this opens with the Jews said to him, who are we talking about? Jesus and his disciples, or everyone in this story is a Jew. So when it says the Jews, who does it mean? People in the temple? The Pharisees? I think it often does mean that they're Pharisees. And which people in the temple? Like the those who run the temple? Yeah, the temple authorities, right? So like, think of it this way. Um, Jordan Childs has been directed to give back her medal, but the Americans have protested. Okay, who are the Americans? I'm an American. Does that mean me? I, did, was I part of that, you know, official protest? Maybe I might personally protest, but I was not part of the official protest, right? Instead, it's those who are in authority in a U.S. gymnastics they are the ones who have protested, which are the Americans, right? The ones in authority in that situation. 
And so right here, we get what something that John is going to do over and over through the rest of the book. So we have to understand this or else it looks like he's always bagging on the Jews. Oh, and then it's confusing because everyone's a Jew in most of these stories, not in all of them, but in many of them. Right. So every, every time he says the Jews, he pretty much means um some ruling group, some authoritative group of Jews, right? So here, the temple authorities, later, the Pharisees. It's the faction of Jewish leadership that is opposed to Jesus, right? And, you know, this would be natural maybe for John, because by the time that he's writing um, in the late first century is one um, time that we might place this. Um, there's a significant division between Jewish believers in Jesus and the Jews who are leaders in non Jesus believing Judaism, right? And we have documentation that says that Christians were Christians who were Jews, but now they're Christians are being put out of the synagogue. And so there's a division that opens up. And I think we hear that in John's language. Um, but it's it's even reflected here. This is the faction that is opposed to Jesus. Okay, so what do the Jews, meaning the Jewish temple authorities here, ask for? They're asking for a sign. That he yeah. has the authority. Okay, a sign. We know Jesus was already doing signs during this period. Like if we look ahead down to verse 23, people are seeing the signs he was doing so he's already doing signs but you're right they want a sign to indicate his authority right who are you to say what the temple should be and jesus authority especially as it relates to his identity his origin and his destiny is at the center that is the central question of the gospel of john and indeed any gospel right and any gospel reader. Like that is the question that is put to us. Who is Jesus? What is his authority? Where does he come from? What is he doing? Okay, what sign does Jesus offer? Rebuilding the temple. Yeah, yeah. Specifically, he says, um, how, why will the temple need rebuilding? They'll destroy it and then... Right, they will destroy it. He just, Jesus is not threatening to destroy the temple. He says, destroy it and I will raise it up in three days. What kind of response does he get from the Jewish leaders? They can't understand it. They can't understand. Okay, so this is funny. Um, it is funny in a, a, a literary device called ironic misunderstanding, right? This is when a character misunderstands and misstates in a way that is amusing or ridiculous, but the audience knows the real understanding, right? And our narrator really spells it out for us. What is Jesus really talking about? The crucifixion himself. Yeah. yeah. The temple of his body right his own death and resurrection so to understand why he would equate the temple with his own self and what is going on here and what does this mean let's think about what is the meaning of the temple what does it represent theologically what is the temple and man come together it's god's house where they can be the place where god and man come together right? This is the presence of God among the people of Israel. That's what the temple, the tabernacle before it and the temple have always represented, right? Because this is a place where God's glory, first in the fiery, cloudy pillar, um, descended into the very midst of the people, the center of the camp to dwell with the people. It was the place where heaven and earth met. And it was the place where God put God's name as a witness to the nations, right? So this is God among us. That's what the temple means. God is our God and God is right here. So in Jesus' statement, the temple, you know, the building, the Jewish institution that is the place of presence is being replaced by what? By him. By himself. 
right? By his own body, which they would indeed destroy. Jesus has replaced the Jewish temple, the place of the name and the presence and the glory of God with his own self. Jesus is the new temple where heaven and earth meet. And this draws right back from the prologue, doesn't it? Um, he put on flesh and tabernacled among us. And now we see here he is replacing the temple in this scene. And just as the Israelite assumption was that God would never let the temple be destroyed and send us into exile, but God did, we see that Jesus would mm -hmm. indeed allow himself to be destroyed for the purpose of salvation. It, this is such a powerful scene of the second institution, right? We have the institution of the wedding, and then we have the institution of the temple and the new temple of Jesus. Questions or comments on this? It's kind of funny because they've asked for a sign, and indeed he is giving them a sign. I mean, he's giving them a prophecy. One yes. that they already know, but... They, they don't know, but it will come true. It's we can understand it as a sign. Yes. Yeah. And John, and now the whole structure of John is like there's seven signs in the first half, and then the entire second half is built around the sign of the crucifixion and the resurrection, the great final sign of all. Yeah. Yeah. What else? Other other thoughts? Well, this passage concludes with a little bridge statement in 23 through 25, um, which I'm going to read because uh, I'm going to replace some of the words um, so that we can see the wordplay going on in the original language. OK, so um, now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many trusted pisteo it's the same word for believed or trusted many trusted in his name observing the signs which he was doing but jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to any of them okay they say they trust him but jesus doesn't trust their trust right was not entrusted himself for any of them for he knew all people is implied it's not in there and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, anthropos, um, the word from which we get anthropology, um, a study of mankind, um, he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Okay repetition of that word man twice here and so we're on alert right when we see a word repeated um we're like hmm, that's interesting wonder if that means something so we'll hold that in in reserve and see if that means something so jesus is holding up the question who is really a believer who is really a true disciple and we don't know and that question hangs in the air and leads us into the next section. Would someone read for us John 3, 1 through 4? I'll read it. Thank you. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Thank you. Okay. So um, verse one, how is Nicodemus described? Who is this? Ruler of the Jews. He's a ruler. Yeah. What else? 
Pharisee. Pharisee. Ooh. He came to Jesus by night. Okay. He's someone who came to Jesus by night. Now, is John giving us that little tidbit as just a random detail because he just wants to be um, cinematic? No. No, no, John doesn't play that way. If he tells us something is night, then we know he is contrasting night and darkness with day and light. So why do you think Nicodemus came at night? He was curious and I think his heart was being turned toward uh, the work of God through Jesus. And I believe that that was a possible hindrance for him to say out loud or be seen consorting with Jesus and so he felt like to learn more he had to do that in the dark where no one could see secrecy yeah what did you started to say something either Bethany or Paige I couldn't tell who oh I was just getting at what she was saying that he doesn't want people to know that he's conversing with Jesus yeah so we have this sense of like okay he is a Pharisee and a ruler, and yet, and so he he has some, when we have status, then we have risk, right? This is just, this is the way the world works. Status means that you have status to risk. And so is he at risk to openly trust Jesus? We also know, look at this, now there was a man of the Pharisees, an anthropos of the Pharisees, right? Like it would have been just as easy for John to say, now there was a Pharisee, right? Pharisee is often a noun. Instead, he says, man, right after the previous verse, Jesus knew all men and he knew what was in a man. Now there was a man of the Pharisees. And mm -hmm. so we have to say like, oh, Jesus knows Nicodemus. And he maybe he's one of these that Jesus cannot yet entrust himself to, right? So D Nicodemus' discipleship is in question, right? And yet we see like he recognizes things about Jesus. What does he say about Jesus? He has to be from God. He must be, right? Because of the signs he he's doing. Yeah, so he has seen the signs. He's recognizing that he's from God. He recognizes that Jesus' um, signs point to something. And so Nicodemus is in it, right? He is right in the center of do I or don't I? And what will it cost? That's kind of the opening picture we get of Nicodemus. Um there's also a little, uh, like, okay, well, two things. First, what is Nicodemus's question or topic that he brings to Jesus? It says, you have come as, from God as a teacher. Okay, you have oh, come from yeah. God as a teacher. And then later, Jesus says, you are a teacher of the Jews, and yet you don't understand. So Nicodemus is himself a rabbi, and he recognizes Jesus as a rabbi. What else? Do, what, what does he ask Jesus? What's his question? How can a man be born again in his this womb? Okay, he gets there, but initially he doesn't ask a question. He does not present a need to Jesus, right? He's sort he I, I think we get a sense of his in-betweenness in the fact that he just comes and goes, Oh, uh, you must come from God. You know, he doesn't he doesn't open himself up to a need. Have you ever done that? You're like, well, I'll just try to get the conversation started. I see if I get an opening, you know. So I, I think there's a sense of, of Nicodemus sort of in between status there as well. At least it feels that way to me. That's a little bit of, of maybe speculation there. Jesus tells Nicodemus, um, yours may say, I tell you the truth. It is amen, amen. We see this is characteristic of John's writing. This is the second time, but there are 25 times across the gospel that it's truly, truly, or amen, amen. Unless one is born, and this word is anothen, 
he cannot see the kingdom of God. What translations do y'all have for that? Unless one is born. I have born again. Born again. Again. Of Anything water different than again? Mine says again or from above. From above. The, this, the literal meaning is from above, but it can mean again. And so we have a word play in Greek. We have a double meaning here. Unless one is born from above or again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And this is where we get another ironic misunderstanding, right? Because Nicodemus, he, how is he, how is he doing on knowing what Jesus means? A little too literal. Very literal. <laughs> Yeah, it is sort of in, in a ridiculous way, right? In a slightly humorous way. Again, can he enter his mother's womb again? Like, you know, like obviously Nicodemus doesn't think that's what Jesus means. And yet that's all he seems to know about what Jesus is talking about. What is Jesus talking about? What is the kingdom of God? That which is born of the flesh, the flesh is born of the spirit. Okay, it's, it, it does say being born from above is being born of the spirit. Yeah, what? that's how you see the kingdom of God. What's the kingdom of God? God with us, God on earth. Okay, God with us. Yeah, the way I remember, this is a, this is kind of an abstract sort of phrase um, and I think it's hard for us to, like, I always have to remind myself what this means. And I always start with the kingdom of God is the place where God is king. And then, you know, I break that down into this is the sphere, the place and time in which God's will for the world, my heart, my life, other people's lives is the way things are. God's will becomes the way things are. That's where God is king. That's the kingdom of God. And so we, this is why, you know, when we talk about the kingdom of God, it's both right now and it's not until later, right? Because right now, those who are born again, those who are born above of water and the spirit can join the realm where God's way becomes the way it is in my heart. And this is what Jesus is offering us. The God's, God's wholeness, God's holiness, God's goodness can become the way it is from the inside out. But the world is not completely under God's way, right? The world exists in Ah, so much that is not God's will, and it will not be until the end, until the day, the final day of the Lord, when everything is under his feet, as Hebrews 2 says, when everything is the way God would will it to be. So that's the kingdom of God, that idea. And Jesus says, you can't see it until you're born from above. What does being born from above even mean? A spiritual birth. A spiritual birth? Yeah. Jesus, we again, we take our understanding from the prologue. This prologue keeps giving us clues over and over to understand these passages that are very difficult, right? Jesus is from above where the word was with God and was God. And our being from above is becoming children of God, right? We're born into God's family. We become children of God when we receive Jesus. Um, prologue uh, verse 12. So this, you know, that sense of it, we have, you know, because we have the, we have the prologue, we have the perspective. Nicodemus has no <laughs> comprehension yet, right? Um, Let's look, let's go ahead and read. We, we mentioned this already, but let's read verses 5 through 15. Paige, that would be great. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. 
flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it is coming from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. You are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things? Very truly, I tell you, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak of heavenly things? No one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the son of man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Thank you. Okay. So Jesus says you have to be born of water and the spirit. And this is the Greek word pneuma. And the funny thing about pneuma, and the Hebrew word is actually similar, is that it means both spirit and also wind. Um, so that you get, so that when Jesus says this funny saying, um, our translators translate the same word in two completely different ways to us, but in the original, it's the same word. So listen to this. The pneuma blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it but do not know where it comes from and where it's going so it is with everyone who is born with the pneuma and so he's making this parallel by using um i mean we would call it a pun but it's not like lowbrow humor it's it's this um word play so that wind and spirit are the exact same word. Now, this is a strange saying. What do you think it means? I think, I, well, I don't know. I don't know if this is what you're after, but looking at the word pneuma and thinking, connecting that to like your lungs and pneumonia and breath, like I'm looking at the spirit as the breath of God in, ah. in, in a sense. Yeah. So it's this, so yes, wind, breath, spirit, all the same word. It's the word from which we get pneumatic pneumonia, you know, yes, exactly. Um, it has cognates in English, you know, the way it's been drawn through, um, which makes it a little easier to remember, I think. Um, and so there's something about, uh, the breath of God being in a person here. Mm -hmm. What else? What do, what do you, what might Jesus mean with this odd little bit? There's, there's a interesting thing going on here where um, Nicodemus has definitely not taken a very literal understanding of what jesus is saying because he's like okay obviously we can't be born twice there's sarcasm when, when he's saying that so there's kind of this underlying playfulness in his use of pneuma and the double meaning to it you want to be really literal like you know the wind goes wherever it wants and it you can't see it you don't you feel it you know it's there but but it does have that second meaning yeah the pneuma goes where it wishes. So I think, you know, Nicodemus has come at night. He has, he doesn't understand and he isn't, he isn't really ready to commit completely, is he? And so I think what Jesus is saying here is you're not going to be able to nail it all down before you decide whether to trust in me. You know, you won't understand what God is doing. You won't understand what God's messengers are doing. And yet the choice is still presented. And Jesus says, you're the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things. Nicodemus clearly does not understand these things. So who has become the teacher of Israel? Jesus. 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 Yeah. 
This is our third Jewish institution, the institution of the rabbi, and Jesus has surpassed or replaced the Jewish institution of the rabbi, the teacher of Israel. And Jesus says Nicodemus didn't even believe his testimony about earthly things. And this is another mystery. He may be talking about what he just said uh, about destroying the temple and raising it in three days, which Nicodemus did not understand either because none of them understood it until, you know, late, this later reflection, right? Um, but he goes on to say, as Moses lifted up the serpent, in the wilderness so let's talk there's a there's obviously a story here right so let's talk about this story this is in numbers 21 4 through 9 i'll just read it out then they set out so th let me set it up first the israelites have come out of slavery in egypt and they are they've been saved um through the red sea and they're wandering and they have some complaints and it keeps you know the the complaint cycle keeps going right this is one of their complaint cycles where they grumble against moses and against god okay verse four then they set out from mount hor by the way of the red sea to go around the land of edom and god talks about how he has to take them around places because he doesn't think they can stand up to war and you know like god is trying to you know shepherd them well right and the people became impatient because of the journey. And the people spoke against God and Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in this wilderness? There is no food and no water. And we loathe this miserable food, which cracks me up because they're like, there's no food, but we don't like the food, right? <laughs> they got yeah. a lot of complaints and the complaints don't have to be consistent. <laughs> okay. Verse six, the Lord Yahweh sent fiery serpents among the people and they bit the people so that many people of Israel died. And the people came to Moses and said, we have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord, against Yahweh and against you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard and it shall, or a, or a pole, um, it can say, um, and it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on a standard. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked on the bronze serpent, he lived. Okay, why this story? This is kind of a weird story, right? What do you all notice? Well, The sign is pointing to the son of man. So, but the, I, Darren and I were talking and I was asking them about the fiery versus the bronze serpent. And what did that mean? Yeah. So, you, you want to talk about the fiery serpents? Yeah. I just, the, well, what I understand or what I, I know about it is that the fiery serpents are seraphs um, okay. or a nod to seraphs. I'm not quite really sure, but it, it's a, Darren's term is a spiritual serpent. Okay. Um, this is hard to translate. Yeah. So this word for fiery serpents is the same word in the plural. It's seraphim and the seraphim are like, you know, when you hear about cherubim and seraphim, these are heavenly beings. The seraphim, the cherubim are winged angel lions. Um, they're not chubby babies, um, as uh, Dr. Ship would always yeah. make sure to point out to us, right? These are winged angel lions, the cherubim are, and the seraphim are winged fire snakes, right? And these are it was um, composite beings, beings that are a mix of species, I guess we would say, are uh, always used to represent heavenly beings, um, composite beings, right? And so this is in the literature of uh, the Israelites and also other um, peoples of the time, composite beings equal heavenly beings, right? And in Isaiah 6, 2 through 6, it's these winged fiery snakes, the seraphim, 
are that are around the throne of God proclaiming holy, holy, holy. But yet in this passage, these do not seem to be things that are flying around saying holy, holy, holy. They're like coming among the people and biting them and they're dying, right? And so our translators have translated this as venomous snakes, snakes with a fiery bite, right? Because they're trying to make sense of the story, right? They have, they want to translate it in a way that makes sense. But if we know that this is the word seraphim, we can sort of, we can see different symbolism in this story. So that these are not just, they may be earthly snakes, but they are earthly snakes who are presented as messengers of the divine. And here, messengers of divine judgment against the people who are doing wrong, right? And they bring in this, um, in the Isaiah passage, a seraph comes and touches Isaiah's mouth with a coal as a fire of purification. And so there seems to be a fire of purification among the Israelites and their complaints. And though they still suffer, the people who see the bronze serve, the seraph on a pole, are saved, right? And so there are parallels to our Jesus story here, right? Israel is maybe also here, not following God well, and maybe they are suffering for it in the post-exilic situation of Jesus' day, right? There may be an implication like you are no better than those grumblers in the wilderness that you look back on in the, the ancient stories, right? And then the parallel to the seraph lifted up is what? We know this, right? What's, what's the answer? I see nodding. <laughs> fill it in. Jesus lifted up on the cross, mm -hmm. right? On the tree, on the pole, if you will, right? So the Nicodemus who doesn't yet know of the cross should still be able to understand that Jesus is telling him that God will provide salvation through one who is from God, who brings God's message. And Jesus is claiming here that believing in Jesus will be the key to life. Questions or comments on this section of the passage? That reminds me, and it means it brings a lot more meaning to the song, Holy, 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 because it's seraphim and heaven. And yeah. Yeah. Holy, Holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Yeah, that's a, that is the celebration song around the throne of God. And so, you know, when we join in that through the salvation of Jesus, we can participate in the worship of the one who brings us his holiness, his salvation. Absolutely. What else? Wow. Go ahead, Bethany. Oh, I'm curious, kind of sidetracking here down um, the seraphim story. Why snakes? I mean, there's this whole connection to the snake in the garden, and and now it's a snake being raised to save them. Seems the best, backwards. Yeah, it's backwards. And on top of that, God, you know, God's risking a lot by saying, we're going to make this thing that's not an idol that you're going to look at and when you look at it i'm saving you but but don't worship it, it. it's not yeah don't worship you know what i mean it's just and, and in fact later much much later they have to take the pole they find that israel has been worshiping the pole and then they have to get rid of it because it becomes an idol yeah so yeah. exactly yeah. yeah yeah why snakes um I, I don't know <laughs> as, as none of us, you know, I think this has to do with Egypt. 
and the, the power and the symbolism of Egypt. Um, you remember that Moses' staff becomes a snake and he picks it up and it becomes a staff, or throw it down again, becomes a snake, eats the other snakes that the magician staffs have turned into, you know. So there is a, um, and the, we have some archaeology that shows um, thrones, uh, ancient times, um, thrones were often uh decorated with these composite beings who are understood to be heavenly creatures and the thrones of Egypt are decorated with snake composites. Um, and so I, I think that's why I think we're um, drawing on the imagery of Egypt and the um, I guess God's victory over um, Egyptian gods. Um, that's a little thin, I'll tell you, to try to justify. I don't know. Did anyone else have a thought? No, what came up for me was probably something totally a rabbit trail, but I was like, okay, some of them were bit and they died. They didn't yeah. have a chance to like get the instructions to look upon it and <laughs> be saved. But then the other part of it is, what for those who got bit but like didn't look upon it or why would they choose not to look upon it or did they all look upon it like i just was left with more questions about yeah about the whole thing rather right. than answers i will now provide satisfactory answers to all your questions thank you <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't i mean some of these are like there's some significant loss of life in these stories mm -hmm. right the over and over the people who will not obey they do die all the way dead right like it's a there is a, a sense of finality and um I think we say harsh judgment. I think that would be our inclination is to say harsh judgment. I will say that like, you know, God had already saved these people a number of times. And so they're up there. They keep being invited to trust in God and they keep choosing not to. Mm -hmm. And so when they die, before they even have a chance to look on the snakes, we do have to remember that they had a chance to trust in God before this and were, and many chances. And so maybe, and I hadn't thought of this until right now as we're saying it, but maybe this is part of why this story, because isn't this story about Nicodemus and what he will choose, right? are you going to trust in the one who is providing life and would you like to do it now or would you like to wait until you're hanging by a thread and bitten by a fiery serpent like you know i in the in the old testament story and here we are in a story about choice for nicodemus um since we're short on time i'm going to rush us on a little bit and do the last section um beginning in verse 16 i will make a quick note that some of your passages will continue jesus speaking and some of them will switch to the narrator speaking um so some if you have a red letter version it may go from red to black or it may stay red if you have quote i mean if you don't eat whether you have a red letter version or not you may, you have may have an end quote after 15 or you may have no end quote and then and then continue the quote in 16. translators don't really know if so quotes are not in the original greek does not have the quote marks like that and so translators have to decide whether someone is still speaking or not and john i point this out because it happens repeatedly in john where jesus is having a conversational dialogue and then suddenly he's having a monologue or the narrator has stepped in and we can't really tell which and i think it's i think john just wants to tell us whether in john's words or in jesus direct speech 
Jesus's continued teaching on this subject. And we have that right here. Verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. One of the most beloved verses um, in our scriptures for us. For God did not send the son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him, in Jesus, is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the judgment. That light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested or revealed as being wrought in God. And what do you think this paragraph is saying? What does this say to you? He's talking to Nicodemus about if, if you don't want to come along, if you don't want to believe, you're, you know, you have things to hide. You, you pit, you'd rather stay wallowed in your sin than. Yeah. And don't we all have things to hide, right? Oh, don't we all have deeds that we would rather not be exposed by the light? And if we come to the light, they will be exposed, all of our deeds. So what is the cost? And is it worth it? You notice the, the nature of judgment here is that this is the judgment. Men, the light has come into the world, right? He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed. And so there is a real sense of what is your response? Judgment comes because of the choice to not believe. And so this idea of will you be a disciple of Jesus is presented to Nicodemus and it is presented to us. And all of that is couched in God's motivation for sending Jesus into the world, which is God's great love for all of us, for believers, for all, everyone who would believe through the generations, for God so loved the world. And so we have Nicodemus here. He's in the category of people who haven't decided. Um, he doesn't, we don't get the marks of a disciple like we did in chapter one. Remember those disciples, we had all the names of Jesus, the titles of Jesus proclaimed in various form. We had people who would come and see. We had people who remained with Jesus. We had people who would bring someone to Jesus. We get none of that in Nicodemus. Instead, we get these offerings of what is your response here. And the problem is that when you are in the darkness, the darkness cannot comprehend the light. Again, from the prologue, right? Nicodemus can't understand Jesus because he has not yet accepted the light. He has not accepted the cost that he his deeds will be exposed just like any of us, not that Nicodemus has some great thing to hide, just that we all do. He has a decision to make. He is not yet a true disciple. And so John is still so early in his gospel, right? But we see that John replaces the rabbi who won't accept God's true light yet with Jesus, the light that is coming into the world. And we see this critical necessity that we will have, every reader of this gospel will have to decide, is it really worth the cost of following Jesus? And in it, we know that Jesus' invitation to believe in him is motivated from the great self-giving love of God. And so we decide whether we will look to the one who is lifted up and maybe go through the fiery process 
of um, the purifying fire of God's presence to believe in Jesus and step into the light. Well, we have covered too much for one hour, but we did it. <laughs> um, we saw Jesus replace the temple with himself as God's presence and replace the rabbi with himself as the teacher and savior of Israel and that invitation to believe. Next week, we will uh, meet again. We'll, we're on a more consistent schedule now for a few weeks. We will be um, in chapter four, and we will see Jesus with the woman at the well, Samaritan woman at the well. So I hope you all will be able to be with us then. Any final comments? Thank you, Deanna. Thank you. It was a good discussion. I enjoyed it. Even though I rushed y'all along some. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop the recording and we can do our prayer time. Darren, you know you're allowed to talk. <laughs>